All right. So, um, like I said, I, I think I mentioned ahead of time, but I, I've been at camp uh, all week. And so I, I did try to respond to emails every day, but I haven't yet looked at your, um, your memos. Um, and so I'll try to look at those today and tomorrow and get them back to you. Uh, here's what I anticipate. I anticipate that as long as you made a good solid try that you'll get full credit and we won't have to go through a second round of them. Um, if there's some that are, if there's something that has like a, a real concern or something like that, um, then, then I might send it back uh, for feedback um, and with a chance to resubmit. But I think, you know, I, it, the, the assignment is interesting to me because nowhere I've worked in the last 20 years has used like memorandum form, like formal memoranda, like, like even when you're writing to your boss saying, hey, I found an error, it's just an email. <laughs> it's just like, hey, you know, Jeff, I was looking at these, uh, these statements and I think we accidentally, uh, you know, claimed an expense on things that have yet to be uh, expensed and, and like that would be it. Uh, and so I, I almost feel like the assignment is, I don't know, like old fashioned in the sense of like, that's just not how most business communications are happening today. Um, now you might work somewhere that's more formal uh, where they want, you know, a, a memo, but anyway, and so, and so when, you know, when people asked, it was like, Hey, a memo form is fine. An email to you, to the boss is fine. The biggest concern I, I have is every once in a while, I'll see people who will write something that's really, I guess, like super strongly worded, like, instead of saying, it looks like we made a mistake here and here's how to fix it. They're like saying, it looks like you guys are trying to commit fraud and you know, like don't use the F word and that's fraud um, <laughs> with, with the boss at the accounting firm, uh, at least not in the first email, um, probably not in the second or third even. Uh, you know, for me, if I were going to say that word, I, it would mean like I had tried and tried and they were blowing me off. And you know, it would be like the thing I sent before I, I had to like, resign because I couldn't work in a place that was like that. Um, so, so that would be like my, my biggest concern is, is um, and I see that actually a lot with the younger, with our younger students. Um, I like, it, it, they go straight to like really serious, strong tone language instead of kind of a more like, hey, notice this issue. Anyway, so, but like I said, I don't anticipate you know, it wasn't meant to be like a, an assignment that was going to cost us hours and hours and hours of our time. Um, and so if, if you wrote a good solid memo, then I'll give you full credit and we'll move forward. Um, anyway, that was my plan. If you're like, no, I want feedback so I can rewrite it. Like if I give you hundred percent and you hate that, you can put it in there and say, no, I want less than hundred percent and I want to rewrite it or whatever. <laughs> That's what I think that I'll do. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. <laughs> Just, uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't want to get all the all the points I can just yes less. no and I mean I'll try to provide meaningful feedback if I think there's an issue or something of course I would be like hey you know like maybe the tone of this is too strong or something but yeah I think that I got uh on my memo the uh like I got the thing that like the it sends like like maybe you're pl plagiarizing or something because I was trying to be funny with the names like the memo names and right. I, copied that off of a website i think that that popped it up. i don't well, know i mean well that little so just so you know that like turn it in thing pops up for everyone and on oh. my on my end it shows okay. that you, that you have an original you have you have an original originality index of zero which means it's not finding any references to what you put or at least not enough that it's that it's ringing alarm bells okay so, I, I saw that and i got i was like I didn't do anything except yeah. this is the only thing I thought that it could be, but. Yeah. And I'll, I'll tell okay. you, so if somebody gets a high, like a high index, like, you know, it comes back at 50%, looks like it's from another source. Then the first thing I do is look and if they cited the other source, like if, it, if they were saying, you know, according to the IRS's rules, and then they have a quote in there, then that's fine, right? As long as they're right. citing it. Um, but if it looks like they pulled it from some other student's paper, then I usually say, hey, you're probably going to have to resubmit this. <laughs> Uh, this is an academic integrity violation or something really That's sternly right. worded. That's um, right. Uh, anyway. So I wasn't trying to do that, but I I don't know if you looked at the names of all the people that were getting my memo, but you know, if you, uh, between all the activities that you do, you can take time to look at that if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, so we, we did, we did go repelling and my wife nearly died, but uh, we caught her. 
she's she's sometimes more aggressive than a grandma should be i think uh anyway but uh <laughs> She's like, oh, I'm doing this. And I'm like, well, have fun. I'll stand here and take pictures. <laughs> I, I did rappelling 10 years ago when I was 50 yeah. pounds lighter. Um, I anyway. didn't do it then either. <laughs> yeah, that's scary. <laughs> so so what, what I wanted to do, um, unless you had a better idea or, or something that you want us to see in particular, I just kind of wanted to briefly go over a couple concepts from the chapter. Um, and and then and then if you have like specific problems or something you want to look at or talk about the exam a little bit but again i can't talk about it too much all i can really do is pull up the exam review the same one you can pull up and and go through it but I, if you had like if you were looking at that exam review and you were like what is that or something i'd be glad to to talk through some portion of it um okay so let me just bring up my little let's see here it is Make sure I'm in the, I'm teaching these two different classes and they're like a week off from each other. So like, I'm like, which one is it? Um, so let's see. I just wanna make sure I get the right one for you guys. So this should be, oh, now it looks like I have the same thing up, sorry. Yeah, it's like we're in the same chapter in both classes, but they're to they're like a week off from each other on content. I don't really appreciate that about it. Um, give me one more minute, I apologize. My question is what's kind of like, the easiest way to remember what goes on the bank statement side and what goes on the book value side. Cause I feel like I don't just have those like very good. It's just like, I had to keep on looking in the book to know like, Hey, what goes here? What goes here? That's what I struggled with. Okay. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, so let me bring this up before I lose it again. And then I will answer that question. Uh, sorry, I'm having, I'm on my laptop, so I'm using like the little trackpad and I don't love it. But I'm not complaining because I'm grateful that I have a laptop. See, isn't that nice? Um, <laughs> we have all these first world problems. We're like, uh, like Jane Jetson, right? And sitting at home, pushing buttons all day, honey. It's exhausting. Um, all right, so 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 to answer that question, um, so first, like yeah, I have to like to me, it's like hard to conceptualize what you're doing when you do a bank reconciliation. In essence, it would be like like when I used to do this in the good old days, I would actually have my bank statement in front of me and my books in front of me, my my record of of my of journal entries, and 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 then my my. Um, and so then what I would be doing is comparing the bank statement to the book. And so some things um, will be in my book that I've recorded in my book because you, you record things in your book chronologically. So like each time you write a check to a, to a vendor or something like that, you would record that in your book. Each time you deposit money in the bank, you record that in your book. So then you get your bank statement and you're kind of going and saying, okay, this check that I have in my book, it matches the one showing on the bank statement and you kind of check them both off, right? And that's the process. And so to, to reconcile, we have to account for the fact that there might be things that we've written in our book, but that aren't yet on the bank statement. Like if I wrote a check and gave it to somebody and they haven't deposited it yet, it'll be in my book, but it won't be on my bank statement yet. Why? Because it hasn't cleared the bank. So the bank adjustments, when we talk about book side adjustments and bank side adjustments, the bank side adjustments are any of those items that are in my book, but not on my bank statement. So I have to adjust the balance of that bank statement to account for those items um, that, are, that, that, that aren't yet there. Okay, so that way it'll match up with my book. So that is deposits in transit, which means deposits I've made 
and recorded in my book but aren't yet showing up at the bank. Usually that means deposits I've made within the last couple of days of the month when they've already sort of closed out the bank period, okay? And outstanding checks. So any checks I've written but haven't yet cleared the bank. Uh, and then the only other adjustment typically I would make to the bank statement would be if there was an error on the bank statement. So I double check it. I see that there's a difference between what's in my book and what's on the statement. And I double check and I know my book is correct. So I need to adjust for that bank or I actually need to call the bank and say, hey, you got this wrong and I can prove it with my canceled check or whatever. We don't have canceled checks anymore. Now we pull up our online and you can see the check. But so, so that's, the, that's, that's the adjustments you make to the, to the bank side is anything that's in your books and you know it to be true, but it's not yet on the bank statement. Deposits in transit, outstanding checks and, and, and bank errors, okay? The other side of that is, is what would be a book adjustment? That would be any items that are on the statement and are correct, but aren't in my book yet. This would be like if the bank uh, paid me interest Right? I wouldn't have that in my books yet until I got the statement and saw, oh, okay, they paid me, nowadays, they paid me seven cents interest. Wonderful. So I have to adjust my book to show that seven cents. Uh, other examples, I had, like from, we sold uh, the assets of one of our businesses last year, and, and we actually have a third-party agency that, that collects the payment and then just deposits it in my checking account. And so that's not in my book yet, right? It's this collection happening by the bank on behalf of me. And then each month when I get the statement, I can say, oh, yep, there it is, and enter it in my book. So the, the, the book adjustments are any, any amounts that are on the statement, but not yet in the book. Now I'm going to go through an example in a minute, but that was kind of a, <laughs> kind of the answer to the question as best as I can give it without like showing you an example. So let me, let me just- Can I interrupt you really quick? Sure. Okay, uh, this is gonna be a stupid question that I should know the answer to. But when they say um, there's a note in there, is that a an increase? What is a note? I don't know why I just don't know what it is. Like, is that an increase in like the bank? Could it, what is a note? So, well, so in, in the context of these problems, it's usually a note receivable. Okay, meaning uh, like in my case, like what I just explained, I, I sold my business. I carried the note, so I have this note receivable, and then the person I sold it to is making payments to me every month. But they're not sending me a check. It's just going, it's being, you know, direct withdrawal from their account and direct deposited into my account. So it's just a, like a direct deposit. It's an uh -huh. increase into that. Right. Although it's possible, okay, that I have a note payable that I also have coming directly out. So it can be confusing if it doesn't say <laughs> receivable or payable. And so when you're looking at your bank statement for the purpose of the, these problems, you just have to see, was it a credit to the account or a debit? Um, so one other thing that confuses people um, is we typically speak, right, that with assets, and in our mind, our bank account is an asset to us. It's our cash account. But we tend to think a debit, we well, not tend to think, a debit would increase the cash account and a credit would decrease it. But in bank terms, they always speak of debiting your account um, uh, when they take money out of it and crediting the account when they put money in. So that's confusing. The reason they do that is because they're talking from their point of view. To, their, to the bank's point of view, any account is a payable to them, right? If, if you deposit money in a savings account or a checking account, you're loaning money to the bank. They're not just letting it sit there. They're investing that money. They're not lending it out to other people. And so in their mind, it's a liability. So when they have to put money into your account, okay, that's, that's a credit. <laughs> that's why it confuses everybody, especially people who've worked in banking. They're like, oh, it seems backward. But from the bank standpoint, um, you know, uh, customer accounts are liabilities, uh, money they owe to that customer. If it's a savings or a, or a checking on demand, right? So they have to be prepared for that. With a certificate, certificate of deposit or something like that, they might have more guarantees. You're not going to take it. All right, so I'll, like I said, in fact, I'm gonna kind of just go through this petty cash thing really quick because I think most people are like, yeah, I think I understand it. Uh, and then we'll spend more time on the, on the just walking through a bank reconciliation example. So the first thing though in this chapter that it introduces the idea of a petty cash fund. Um, I have this for like, I'm the treasurer for our AYSO soccer organization here in town. 
And it just, it's a hassle if somebody needs to go and get a $10 thing at the store, you know, or get pizza for the refs for them to have to, you know, I have to give it, write a check and then take it to another board member and have them sign it. Instead, they can just, you know, bring me a receipt and I get an email from the board chair saying, yeah, we approved it. And I just give them their 50 bucks or whatever. So uh, all a petty cash fund is a small amount of cash. Um, and usually it's set by the policy of the organization. A lot of times it's like 200 or $300. That's for those little small purchases that it would be too big of a hassle to go through like a big approval process for. So um, to establish a petty cash fund, it really is as simple as we debit and, and we have a, an account called petty cash. And I mean, so what this would mean is I withdrew $75 from my bank account, checking account and put it in, I don't know, like it, for, for us, it's like a little metal cash box. That, that was the process of creating the petty cash fund. So, I mean, that's what that would look like in real life, that debit to petty cash and credit to cash. Um, and then all we do is we keep track of when somebody draws from it, usually you have some little pre-made ticket that, that says what it's for, who's taking the money and how much. Um, and then they're supposed to like give you a receipt, right? So they're, they're taking $20 to go buy pizza for, you know, a pizza for the refs. And then they come back and hand you the receipt and you staple it to that little ticket and put it in the box. Or, I mean, that's the actual physical process. So we keep track. We can see that this uh, company, they had $71 and 30 cents of petty cash payments during the period. Of, uh, it looks like the month of November. Um, and so, then what we usually do is at the end of the month, or in this case, they did it on November 27th, they just actually do a journal entry in the book when they're going to sort of um, replenish that petty cash supply. And so you'll, you'll see that they, you know, they debit inventory, office supplies expense, delivery expense, miscellaneous expense for the different things. And then they credit cash for the same amount. Um, and then you can see that, you'll see that um, something interesting here, and this is pretty normal, but instead of like what you could do is you could, if you think about it, debit all those expenses or, or inventory in this case, and then credit the petty cash account and then debit the petty cash account and credit the cash account. But instead they just skip that step. So in essence, this is what the term that they use in accounting is impressed. It's an impressed fund, not impressed. Like I'm so impressed with your great talk you gave in church on Sunday, it, it, but impressed meaning it just stays at the same balance all the time. And so when, at the, when we replenish it, we just claim the expense for the items we purchased on the debit side, and then we credit cash and put that cash back into the account. That's the normal process for it. Okay, it's for, so, so, okay, so just to be clear, at the, at the, the, the new month starts, mm -hmm. and if I only spent $3.50, then I credit $3.50, so the next month starts, and I have $75 sitting in that tin box yep. again. Yeah, so okay. if it was $3.50 on pencils, you debit, like, office supplies expense and credit cash, and you wouldn't worry about the petty cash account. Again, if you wanted to, could you debit office supplies ex expense and pet it, uh, credit petty cash to show that petty cash went down by $3.50 and then debit petty cash 350 and credit cash, you could. It's just not the norm or the way it's done. It's always just, they just skip that middle step. Um, you know, here's if, if we decided now we need to keep $100 in the petty cash fund because 75 is not enough. So we would just debit petty cash, credit cash. Um, or the other way, like now so that we don't want to have $75, it's too much risk or whatever. So that's all they're showing there. Um, sometimes, in fact, fairly often, because petty cash is a little dicey, um, you'll be a little over or a little under. You'll, you know, and I'll tell you, even at church, that happens. You'll be like counting up the tithing and like, you know, there'll be like 20 cents or something missing. So some kid wrote their ticket, but didn't put the, or the, or the, or the envelope has a little tear in it or something, right? And so uh, with tithing, what we do is we keep a little bag of change in the office and we just add the 20 cents. And, uh, and, and if it's a larger amount, we'll call the people, right? And say, hey, uh, the amount you put on the slip didn't match. Um, but what we do with a company, if it's usually, if it's a small amount, we'll just debit or credit an account called cash over and short. If we debit it, 
it ends up being an expense. And if we credit it, it ends up being a, a revenue to us. Um, it's such a small amount usually that it's sort of inconsequential, but it's just our way again of, of uh, you see on this one that they um, had $15 in cash remaining at the end of the month, which means they must have spent $185 of the $200 in the account. But when they count up all the tickets, they only have $178 worth of tickets. So the way to handle that would be to debit miscellaneous expense, 178, to debit the cash over account or, or short account. In this case, it's cash short, $7, and then credit cash, 185, and we're back up to the full 200 in the account. All right, so let's talk about bank statements um, because I do, I feel like this chapter often is confusing, like uh, bec mostly because we just don't do it this way anymore. Like, like I, don't, I don't do it this way anymore. I use for, for like our soccer league, I use a, a program called ZipBooks, which is free. And ZipBooks, we log into ZipBooks through, or we log into our Chase account through ZipBooks. And honestly, each time a check clears, it just pops up in ZipBooks and says, this matches the one that you entered. Is it the right one? And I say, yes, and attach the receipt to it or whatever. Um, and then, so it's always in balance with my checking account, right? My book is always matching my, my bank statement and I'm not waiting for a statement. It's just happening live time. That's, that's what we do a lot more now. Um, but still, um, again, it's valuable to sort of understand the process. So here's like a fake, a fake bank statement. Tells us the account had 1610 uh, at the beginning of the month or the beginning of the period and $2,050 at the end. Total checks, total deposits, and then they separate the checks and debits. And you probably looked at your bank statement and lot, they're not always in this same format, but they're similar. They have a list of the checks and debits and a list of the deposits and credits. And then here they have little notes, what each of these things means. Um, So here's kind of a graphic depiction of what I just kind of went over a minute ago. So what we're trying to do with the bank reconciliation is make our adjusted cash balance um, for our bank statement equal the adjusted cash balance per our book or according to our book. Um, so Again, we're going to take a look at our cash, the bank balance. So in the case of this last problem, the bank balance is $2,050. And then we're going to look at our book and say, hey, any deposits we made and recorded in our book, but they're not yet showing on the bank statement, we're going to add them to the bank balance because our book is going to show different, right? It's going to they're not going to be showing on the on the bank statement, but they are going to be showing in our book. Any outstanding checks, we subtract. And then any bank errors, depending on if it's an addition or a subtraction. And then that would give us our adjusted cash balance per the bank statement. Do the same thing. We look at our books. And then we look at the bank statement and any collections or interest we earn, we would add to our book balance any bank fees or NSF or non-sufficient fund checks, we would subtract and we would add or subtract any book errors, depending on if there are addition errors or subtraction errors. And after we do that, our adjusted balance for each account should match. Uh, so that's the process of reconciliation. So here's a little bit, I mean, here's an example. So our bank statement had a, a balance of $2,050. And then if we, I'm going to just go up and, and show you what I mean. No, actually, we don't have our book, but we'll see like, yeah, we don't have all the info here, but so we can see all of these deposits. Okay. And so if we have a deposit recorded in our book, but it's not yet here, then that's a deposit in transit, meaning a deposit we recorded in the book, but it's not on our statement. So we would add that here. Then there's these two checks that are in our book, but they're not yet showing on the statement. So the bank, the statement bal bank statement balance plus the deposits in transit minus the outstanding checks gives us our adjusted bank balance. 
Then on the book side, we would look at our books and it would say, and you know, again, they didn't show us the books, but so they have a balance of 1405 in their books. And then if we go back and look at this statement, we can see that um, this $100 EFT means we re, that we had a deposit of $100 into our account, um, electronic funds transferred into our account, and we had a deposit of $485 with a mark of CM, so a credit memorandum, um, usually meaning the bank collected some money on our behalf. So there's that note they collected. There's the interest we earned. Those are the additions. Check printing charge. And then an NSF check. Um, that's like if a customer writes us a check and then we deposit it and then it bounces because the customer didn't have money in their account. And the two balance. So the other thing is, is any book adjustments we make, we have to also create a journal entry for them. Because what we're doing is we're saying, there we had there's $485 in our account here that we didn't record. Um, and so we're gonna have to do a, 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 a journal entry to record that $485. There's $808 in our account from interest that we didn't record. There's a $23 expense and so forth. Okay, Tara, yeah, you have a question? So wouldn't you um wouldn't you compare this to what like the way back in the day on the back of your statement that you would get in the mail mm -hmm. this is really essential it's essentially what we're doing right it's exactly what we're doing yeah those the, the old statements used to have a reconciliation worksheet on the back of the statement okay so there's finally a good thing about being old <laughs> Yeah, that, that you may have done this at some point. Yes, because I know my kids haven't. No, no. And, <laughs> you know, like, you know, they can just like get a text each time they spend money that gives them their new balance or whatever. And you're like, oh, huh, I yeah, guess well, that makes you, sense. You could just go online, like, before, right. like before you even go to um, spend anything. Let me see how much is in my account. Well, and especially because younger, younger people and even like, I just we don't write checks as much as we used to right so right. there's not as much like ooh, I'm not sure how much is there because I think I have some checks pending I, I mean I hardly ever write checks anymore and so and has taken over <laughs> that's right um well there's one our um we we couldn't for um like when we pay for our um our rent we couldn't that was one that we would have to write a write a check for and i i just like it coming out immediately so i would make make a point of going and just getting a um not a cashier's check a money order yeah. a money order just just so it i know that it's done right not... <laughs> yeah yeah no uh, my i have renters a house we lived in when i was in the military we still we're, we have renters in it and they always pay by money order. What I don't like about them is you, they, the ones I get don't deposit well with like my, my phone deposit, my chase deposit thing. So I'm like, I have to drive to the bank and physically deposit it. I'm like, I will give you $10 off if you just send me a check. But he doesn't, he, he, like you. He, different he, type. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Anyway, so like I said, any adjustments we make to our book, we then have to do a journal entry because we have to show that money actually going into our account. So that bank, that uh, credit memorandum, which was a collection of a note. So in a real problem, they're gonna have to give you a little more detail, right? So that you know, but you'll see they debit cash and credit notes receivable. Um, for the interest earned, they're gonna debit cash and credit interest revenue. And then for the fees, for the check printing fee, they're gonna debit miscellaneous expense and credit cash, because it's a reduction to our cash. And then NSF checks are an interesting thing because what this means is someone has paid us. And when they paid us, what we would have done is we would have recorded our cash account going up, a debit to cash and a credit to accounts receivable because we received the money. Um, or if they were paying us cash at the point of sale, then we would have just debited cash and credited the revenue account, the sales revenue or service, whatever it is our business does. So when their check bounces, what we have to do 
is debit accounts receivable because the customer still owes us that money because we never were able to collect on it. And then we credit cash. So our cash is $30 less than we thought it was because when we got the check, we thought we had the money. So those are the entries that we would make um, based on our reconciliation. So that's really all I had. I would totally be willing to go through like a problem or something that does this if you feel still feeling uncomfortable or if you have other specific problems you want to look at, I would be open to that too. So is there more than, because like I said, my problem before was knowing like what particularly goes on what side. Like I feel like on the quiz access and the quiz and everything, some problems had like some things and others didn't. Whereas like, I don't have it pulled up to like give an example, but I mean like, is the book balance gonna have more than just collection of notes, interest and check printing and NSF? Like, is there other things included? Just to know what all goes on the book balance, right. what all goes on the... So the answer to that is not really. There might be something that has a different name, but I mean, anything that shows up on the statement that we didn't have in our books is gonna be a book adjustment. In other words, think about it. If there's money coming into your account or going out of your account that you didn't know of until you got your statement, then you're gonna to have to adjust for that, adjust your book for that. And when I say didn't know about it, like I know that the people are gonna pay me every month, but I still don't record it in my book until I get the statement and show that I got it, um, you know, just to be sure. So not really, the only, the only thing that they didn't have in this example that you might see is an error. Right, it'll say something like, you know, check number 487, which was written in the books at as, you know, $1,200 uh, was actually, you know, was on the bank statement as 1,020. And analysis of your records tells you that the bank statement's correct, meaning you then have to adjust your books because it was a, a book error. So that's the only thing that you might see that, that really wasn't in this example that I can think of. So I know you explained in your video about outstanding checks, but I just still can't wrap my brain around it. And you may have already covered it because I was a little bit late coming. Mm -hmm. But can you show again how to do outstanding checks? And if you say, if you say, oh, Laurel, I already covered it, I'll just look at it. What, what do you mean by show again how to do it? Okay, so when you are reconciling the bank and your statement side by side, and you have to do a a like a ledger journal entry so you have to they say okay you know account for your outstanding checks how do i do that okay so so first of all you won't you don't have to do a journal entry for outstanding checks because outstanding checks will already be in your book so an outstanding check is something that you had recorded in your book you know that's I, a not I, necessary one for a journal entry not necessary okay and Be because because what's happening there is you've already recorded the check and then you look at your statement and the check's not showing up on there it means whoever you gave the check to hasn't deposited it yet or if they have it was maybe it didn't clear through the whole clearing process okay so then if you have to account for it on the bank side where does that go so outstanding checks would go in the deductions on the bank side. In the deductions. Okay. Right, because, because there's less money in your account than what the bank statement's showing. You know that because you wrote the check. It just it hasn't cleared sense. the bank yet. Yeah. It makes sense when you talk through it. It just didn't make sense to me on paper. Thank you. Anything in it specifically anyone wants to look at? Can you do a little bit of like check errors? Like do check errors happen on both the bank and the book? And then like what determines if it's going to be a positive sure. or a negative? Sure. So the first, the answer to the first question is yes. Sometimes I wrote it correctly in my book. So I write the check to the customer. Then I record it in my book. And then the customer deposits it. And the bank, because now these things are all like electronic red, right? So it's just running through a machine. And so the bank's machine, maybe it confuses my seven with a one or something like that. I mean, that happens. And so 
So when, when we get our bank statement back, the number, the amount the check cleared for doesn't match what's in my book. And so then what I have to do is go pull up, you know, the picture of the check and say, well, what's correct? What's in my book or what the bank statement had? So in the situation where, where in the, it's, it's correct in my book, but wrong at the bank, that's a hassle because I've got to call the bank, right? And say, hey, you made this error. Here's my proof and go through this whole process. Um, but and so a scenario in which I wrote a check for $1,000 just to make the, the numbers easy, uh, but somehow it showed up on my bank statement as $1,100 um, and then the $1,000 was correct. So right now that's, that's showing, okay, $100, if it's a check I wrote, $100 less in my account than there should be. Um, sometimes it happens in the opposite direction. Like I wrote the check for 1100 and it comes out $1,000 on the bank statement. So now that's showing $100 more in my account than there should be. And so I have to make the adjustment accordingly. That's what makes those kind of the hardest thing is because you have to like, you have to like look at it and like puzzle through it and say, you know, what's the problem here? And then other times you'll see a different account between what's in your book and what's on the bank statement. And when you look in your book, you realize, oh, that was my mess up. I really, I did write the check for 1100, but I only wrote a thousand in my book. That's easier because then all you do is adjust your book, right? To make it correct, um, to show that you, you actually paid a hundred dollars more. I don't know if that helps. That was a lot of talking, but I don't know if it helped. Sounds like my parenting style. It does. So to clarify, I guess with the add and subtract, if mm. on the book balance, I received a check, okay, but it was wrong, that would be in the add. So if I, re well, it depends on which way it was wrong. So the same thing, either whether I'm either writing the check or, or you know, making a, uh, writing a check and withdrawing money from my account or depositing money in my account, still it matters what the, what really matters is what's the correct amount, what's the truth, right? So if, if the truth is that there should be a thousand dollars in my account, but they actually put 1100 in my account, then I need to subtract a hundred to bring that back down to the truth. Does that make sense or not really? But with that, would you put that to the add? Like the difference of those two would be in the add or would it be in the subtract on them? You can't necessarily put it as it will always be in the add or it'll always be. It, in the it subtract. depends on the nature of the error. In other words, some errors are showing not enough money in my account. So we would need to add to the bank, you know, statement or balance to make it correct. Is there, is there a good problem to look at that we can maybe, so that would help like I was just gonna trying say, to give number, scenarios and they're like, maybe we can look at one. Let's look at number eight on the quiz access because it shows an error uh -huh. in there. Okay, let's just take a look at it. Like maybe talking through an actual example would be more useful than me coming up with wild guesses as to, or not guesses, but like, you know, scenarios, unless I'm British, then I would come up with scenarios, but uh, I'm not British. Oh, good. You... British. I like it. <laughs> I think the coolest of all accents is actually like South African. Those guys have cool accents. If the you little... want on my notes, I have, I took like, just so I could learn and everything, like pictures of my problems and everything. And then so I could look like, hey, what's the difference between these two? Uh -huh. And I have one where it's saying add an error check here and then decrease an error check here with the problems. Oh, that might actually be. Oh. If you want me to share my screen, I can show that. Yeah, just a second. Let me make it so you can. Okay, yeah, go ahead and share your screen. And I can. And I'll look at it and be like, I have no idea what that is. Like you that still need to happen. enable me. Mm, I don't think so. Let's see. Advanced sharing options. All participants. Am I still sharing? That's yes. the problem. Oh. Okay. Let's see. Stop share. Okay. Now I think it should work. So yeah, for example, here's one problem where there's an error adding to the book balance. 
Mm -hmm. And then right beneath it, I have an error with decoding. Right. So it depends on the nature of the error. So like if, if we go up and read for that first one where we add it, where's the info about it? Right All here. Right. Okay. So we'll see that like, let's see. Check number 919 listed with the canceled checks was correctly drawn for 689 in payment of utility on June 5th. Um, Maybe you can zoom in a bit. Yeah, Maybe it's pretty tiny. Oh, really? Sorry. There you go. <laughs> All right. Um, but we but Gato Clinic mistakenly recorded it with a debit to the utilities expense and a credit to cash in the amount of 698. So this is telling us that the that the bank was correct, right? That it was they correctly drew 689, but we had made an error on our books for 698. So what we have to say to ourselves is, okay, so that's the first question always to answer is like, do I have to adjust the bank statement or the book? or the bank balance or the book balance. So in this case, it's telling us the bank amount is correct. The error is in our book. So, so that's the first question always to answer, bank or book. So now we know it's an error with our book. The question is, well, if the correct amount was 689, but we debited it for 698, then what that means is that we, we showed in our book nine dollars less than there should be right by writing the by recording the check as for a, because when we write a check we're paying money out so if we wrote it for nine dollars over the true amount then we're going to have to add that nine dollars back into our account does that follow yeah it's like the difference so yeah i mean so so question one is is was it the is the book right or the bank right? And in this case, bank's right, so we have to adjust our book. And then the next question is, what's the difference between what we recorded and what's true? And then we have to make the adjustment for that amount. And in this case, the difference was that we had we had nine dollars too much money showing in our account, in essence, because we wrote the check for or we recorded the check for. Um, let's see. The correct answer is that like or we had, we're sorry we had nine dollars right we had nine dollars too little because we wrote the check for nine dollars more than what was true or we recorded it for nine dollars more than what it really was so we're going to have to add that nine dollars back into our account and this one showed the opposite where the error check was actually deducting yeah so here it's number c check number 3056 for july rent expense was correctly written and drawn for 1250 but was erroneously entered in the accounting records as 1240. so again we see that the bank's balance or the bank statement is correct this is an error in our books and i will tell you that the majority of, of errors fall on the book side um, because most bank equipment now that, that does these automatic scanning of checks is pretty accurate um, so in this case, we, the check was supposed to be 1250, but we accidentally recorded it for 1240. Is that what it's saying? It was only entered in the accounting records as 1240. And so, um, we have to take another $10 out of our account, right? Because we, we only wrote that we spent 1240, but we actually spent 1250. Is that right? Yeah, so we're gonna to have to deduct another $10 from our account. It's actually kind of confusing when you try to talk through it. Um, I don't know if you've had this experience yet in accounting where like you think you understand it and then the more you try to talk yourself through it, the more you get into like a weird circle of confusion. Uh, so I just- I talk myself out of it and then I go backwards and then I get it wrong. Just so you know, 20 years in as a career, occasionally it still happens. And then you go talk to another person and be like, this for some reason, and they're just like, Doy, it's this and you're like oh my gosh like I like the more I started trying to convince myself the more confused I got so I don't know does that help so the, the hard thing about that is is there's no there's no one size fits all it depends on the nature of the error whether it's going to be an addition to the statement balance or a deduction to the statement balance or or an addition to the book balance or deduction it depends on the error hmm. He says with a smile. <laughs> You're like, I want things that are clearly and obviously always the same way. That's what I like in life. That's, That's exactly what I was thinking, yeah. actually. 
Well, that's what I anticipated when we had our first kid, how parenting would go, but <laughs> it, it didn't quite work out for that. And, uh, they keep, and then you have like one kid and you're like, oh, okay. And then like the next kid's completely different. And you're like, what the, this is not what the parenting book said. Right, anyway. I didn't even read my book uh, or a book about parenting until the second one. I was like, just, I had this plan that I would just know what my child needed before he even cried. And my mom, my mom just kind of laughed at me. Well, it's easy. You like just watch all the people at church before you have kids and you think you know how to raise their kids because those people, you know, but then you have your own kids and you're like, oh, that stinks. I'm no good at this. Anyway, any, any other specific things to look at? I mean, we are pushing, we've been here almost 50 minutes, so it's okay if we're done. We do reach a point where our brains become addled. I was going to make the suggestion to think of the uh, of this particular uh, um, the reconciliation as the accounting version of of, um, of word problems because there there is no one size you know you kind of have to think it through mm -hmm. um, and I think that's why you were trying to explain the scenario before saying well you deducted or. Um, because that's the part that you want to concentrate on. For sure. And yeah, and kind of like all accounting is word problems, right? Just so you know, in real life, it's easier because it's not a word problem then. I hope so. No, I like for real, like, <laughs> like, like, like these whole like, like transactions, you're not like, wait, am I the buyer or the seller? You're like that in real life, you know, like I'm selling something to somebody or I'm buying something from somebody. <laughs> Instead of trying to like dig out context clues from this big word problem, I feel for these students who are, who are, who English is their second language and they're having to read through these ridiculous uh -huh. and they're just like, I like, like my Chinese is okay, but I would hate to take an accounting class and it like, it would destroy me. Um, anyway, uh, other, other problems to look at before we finish up. Laurelyn looked like she was going to say something. I could sense it. Yeah. Well, I don't know if we already talked about, you know, what to prep for on this exam. I know pretty much just follow the guidelines. Um, but I, and if you want to do this separately, I still really like to see number eight on the quiz access from chapter six. Okay. I just um, got stumped on a couple of things and it. I, I think half of my problem is I get home from work and I feed the family and I your get brain's already at down to 30 percent nine at night and then I'm like what <laughs> so yeah I mean let's let's go ahead and look at it so this is the chapter six quiz access right yeah number eight yeah number eight and I'm just gonna do it in preview mode here which means it'll have the numbers in there already but okay um i was proud of myself the things i did put in there i got right but there were a few things i missed like totally blanked it no, nothing's in there right i was so, like oh how did i do that <laughs> so let's see i'm going to share my screen all right so again like so here's this kind of ludicrous amount of data just sort of dumped on you um with my college, you know, like all my young college students, I say they just barfed data all over you. Um, um, I don't know, they, they like the idea of being barfed on. It's funny to them, I guess. I don't think it's that funny, but that's after eight kids. I've been barfed on a few times. Um, anyway, um, so they give us all this information, right? So we have, uh, here's the bank statement info, a couple of information about checks that are outstanding. And then all of that okay and then it tells us additional information there was an error there's an nsf check received from this customer s nilson who was also in the book example so s nilson's a check bouncer probably won't be taking checks they're going to, have to pay in cash in the future uh, and then a credit memorandum from chavez company by the bank um all right so then it asks us to prepare our bank reconciliation so Honestly, I, for me, <laughs> I would probably come up to here to like this and like take a picture of this with my phone or with my iPad or with something. Uh, or if I had two screens, I would just do a screen grab and put it up so that I don't have to keep scrolling up and down, but we don't always get to do that. So, so 
really quick. Let's looking at the checks. It says that there's three outstanding. Two uh -huh. of them were outstanding in August, but only one is still outstanding in September. Do we have to put all three if it's a September thirtieth? I thought we'd only have to put the September one, and that's why I I missed it. Right. So any check that's outstanding, we're going to have to account for. Okay, because they're going to be in our book, but they're not going to be in our our bank statement. Okay, so whether or not they're still outstanding doesn't even matter. That's completely beyond the point. Well, they we need to be. To, what do you hey, mean? What, what do you mean whether or not they're still outstanding? So it says at the top. Let me get there. All right. Um, two are outstanding. Da, 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 and then this third one's outstanding as of September 30th. Let's see. Bank statement and a book balance cash and officers and it reported two checks outstanding. Yeah, I don't like the way that's worded. It's a little confusing. Right? Because I thought, well, okay, so what, that's in August, so I don't need it in September. But right. well, it's, it's still yeah, there. Well, but it shows that. Okay, what's it asking us to do here, though? It's asking us to do a September 30th bank reconciliation. And so, like this one, 5888 does show up here for $1,003. So that's cleared. 5893 is not on there. Um, and so, 5893 is still outstanding. So that's going to be our first outstanding check right there. Then the other two are going to be. Oh, the other two, you just have to compare records. Right. We have to look at oh, our book. Okay. Yeah. So that's, again, that's I don't know why they're throwing that curveball at us to say, Okay. I guess what they're saying is that's not going to be showing on the books we show you because we're only showing you the September books. And that one's still hanging out from last month. Okay. That makes more sense. So it is I just frustrating when, more carefully. when you like give someone like, like a check and they like put it in their wallet or something and like don't deposit it for months you're like come on man like don't, if you don't need the money then just tear up my check and let me know but um but i've done that where i like put a check there to be careful like i'm going to deposit it and then like the kids pile something on it and then i find it a month later and it's like oh yeah but that doesn't have with big checks just like the little, little ones yeah um anyway so i start with my balance and then i'm looking i have to compare statements for this deposit and transit so i look what i do is I just look at the deposits and I'm like, oh, 1191. And then I come down here and say, okay, there's the deposit for 1191 uh, and so forth. Um, but I'll see that this 1620 on 930 is not showing up. Um, oh, I'm sorry, this 1676 on 930 is not showing up yet in the bank statement. So there's my deposit and transit. These two deposits are not deposits I made. They're things that are showing up on the bank statement that aren't in my book yet. And usually you can tell in these problems because they have some note by them, right? That's a non-sufficient fund. That's interest. That's a credit memorandum. And they usually okay. have. So anyway, so I'll have that the starting amount, then the deposit of September 30th that was in my book, but not on my statement. Then those three outstanding checks, and that will give me my adjusted balance. And then for the book balance, I'll go up and I'll look at my books and somewhere it will tell me that my, let's see. Somewhere it's got to tell me what my beginning balance was and I'm not seeing it. I think. Just say right here. Yeah. It's, August 31st it's balance of so 1699. No. It's, it's. Oh, my September 30th September balance. 30th. Yeah. Yeah. So 19,292. So I'm starting with that September 30th balance. And then I'm just going to go up to the bank statement and say, okay, so these ones with notes by them are things the bank has, has recorded in my account. I have $13 in interest. That's an addition. 
1620 in a credit memorandum. Probably if I look at my notes, I'll see the credit memorandum is from a collection of a $1,620 note by the bank. So I'll add the interest earned in the note proceeds. Then there was an NSF check. And again, that was in the notes. But then the, the, the error is tougher, or does it tell us up front? I think the error is in the bottom. Here in the notes. Here we go. Yeah. Check number 5904 is correctly drawn for 2146 to pay for computer equipment. However, the record keeper misread the amount and entered it in the accounting records with a debit to computer equipment and a credit to cash of 2109. So I'll say, okay. So I spent 2146, but only recorded spending 2109. So the difference between those two is what, $35? And so I, and I spent 35 more than I recorded, okay? So I'm going to have to do a deduction for that error. Oh, sorry, $37, bad mental math um, for that error. So again, I have to go through that process and say, okay, what's correct? It says it was correctly drawn. So it must be my book that's an error. And then how much is the error? And then is it an error that I recorded spending too little or too much. And in this case, I recorded, um, I didn't record the full amount I needed to spend. So I actually spent 16, no, where was it? 2146, but only recorded 2109. So to make that right, I have to spend or record the spending of an additional $37. Okay, it's being done. There we go. So that's that process. I know it's not easy, um, and uh, but I mean that's it. That's what we have. How we how we walk through it. I think my my mistake came in just going off of all the notes and not comparing the two balance sheets well enough. So yeah, and that's they pay more attention. That's the tricky part. Is is and it kind of stinks when you're doing it in, again in a sort of canned classroom scenario, like you're having to compare these two things, um, where again, in, in real life, you know your book pretty well, especially if you're the person who's been recording it. Um, you know, it's not hard to go back and say, oh, there's where I messed that up. It is tougher in a big company where you have lots of people entering data and you're say the controller or the assistant controller who has to do these reconciliations and things, then you have to find other people's errors, but that's why you make the big bucks. Anyway, okay. Is there something that intense on the exam? Like what's that much information? Um, it, it certainly won't be presented like this, where you're, this whole thing's dumped on you like this because it's multiple choice, right? So, but, you know, it, there could be something like, say one of these note statements, like, you know, an NSF check, is like this, um, and it would be like, what would be the journal entry to adjust your books for that or something like that? And then give you three choice or four choices. Okay. But not something where they're really dumping a ton of info on you like this, not, not, at least not at this level. All right, we're out of time. Thank I you. probably have students from the other class coming in. Um, we'll, we will forego the prayer so I can uh, get this stopped and started for the next group thanks for coming Thank in you. all right have a great thanks a, for the fox. a great night bye-bye if you're if you're in here for counting 101 i'm going to actually close this meeting out and then restart so that i can save this recording all right thank you